All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing a live stream today. Pull my best Taylor Swift move. I think I teased some of you to watch this live stream by saying I'm going to pull my best Taylor Swift move. And here's what I mean by that. Is Taylor Swift lost uh, the rights to her music. She didn't own her music anymore. She didn't like that. So I actually had a, had a tweet from Kelly Clarkson, of all people. She said, you know, it'd be a shame, Taylor, if you went back into the studio and re-recorded all your songs because you still own the writing credits to it. When you re-record your songs, they are new, and now you own them. It's a brilliant move. So that's what Taylor Swift has been doing. I said, am I in a similar situation? I gave a presentation at CSM last week, seven days ago today, as I record and live stream, uh, at CSM for APTA is in Boston. And if you weren't there or if you had something else going on or you couldn't make it to Boston, well, that's a shame. Be a shame if I live streamed the presentation, though, so you could watch it live or you could watch the replay. So if you're watching right now, I am just curious. This is purely for research because the goal of the presentation at CSM was for researchers. If you're watching live or the replay, drop down below just who you are, what you do. Are you a clinician? Are you an academic? Are you an educator? Are you a researcher? And then where you are geographically. I am always amazed by where this YouTube stuff that we put out there, the podcast episodes that we share, I'm always amazed where it goes. So feel free to do that. I also want to make sure you understand the physics of this. If you're watching it live and have a question, want to make a comment, a lot of times I say, keep it to yourself and wait to the end. Don't do that. Ask the questions in the comments below. Whenever you want, as it comes to you, shout them out with your keyboard. And then at the end, I'll see if I have time to answer a few of them. If you're watching the replay, can you still ask questions or make comments? Yes, because I'll get a notification and I can chime in and, re and, and, and respond to that. I want to make sure you understand that this is interactive live or if you're watching this later or listening to this later, I'll release it in little bits. So right now, uh, I'll kick things off. I'm watching Kaylee is an academic. She was also a CSM meeting planner. She's watching uh, via Twitter. She says, hi, Jimmy. Hi, Kaylee. Perfect example. Thank you for being my beta tester on that. Now, I'll start off by saying people always ask at the end of a presentation at CSM or any conference I've been to, can I have your slides? I would love your slides. Can I get your slides? And I'm just going to get that out of the way. So I'll put the link in the comments below when the live stream is over and you can download the slides, use them as you want. Just leave my name on there so I get a little credit. Or you can point your camera right now at the screen, at the QR code. And yes, you can has my slides as I kick things off with an internet meme. So QR code that, it'll link it you to Canva and you can download them. Here's the thing. The slides are good, but let's just remember the slides are actually for me. What do I mean by that? Giving a presentation, as I was taught, is about the audience. And the slides, as much as I want to tell part of the story, you are your presentation. The slides are a fraction of the presentation. So we'll start things off by just making sure we're understanding we're on common terms. The things that you'll see supplemented on the screen with my slides are not my presentation. All of this is my presentation. I flew all the way to Boston to stand in front of 100 people and give this presentation. Me plus the slides, 90%, 10%, 95%, 10% is the presentation. So if you want the slides, yes, you can have my slides and there they are. So let's kick this things off, th this presentation off by understanding who I was giving this to and see if you fit that mold. I was asked to explain to researchers how they can improve understanding of their research. I am not a researcher. I am not here to change how you do research. Where I think my background and expertise comes in afterwards is after your research is published. So that's why the title of the presentation was Science Isn't Finished Until It's Understood. We have to have an agreement that this is true. I believe, and I, I, my presentation is to make you understand and believe, that is, your research, your science isn't finished until it's understood. I'm going to break things down simply by starting off. That what you're doing in research, I know how you do it might be complicated. Like maybe you're using technology, you're organizing people, you're testing things. But what you're really trying to do at the base of all of it 
is you are trying to communicate something from yourself or your group to other people. I want to say that this is simple, but not easy. You'll see that theme come up a lot throughout this presentation. My background is in journalism, communications, radio broadcasting, and now podcasting and live streaming. Doesn't sound like research. But where I think I add it is, whenever, when you're done with research, I'm going to give you some of those tools so you can do what's on the screen. It's just two tin cans with a string. Now, the string might be audio or a video or social media platforms or a website. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But remember, simple, not easy. At the base of everything, we are communicating ideas to achieve understanding. You're not done until you achieve understanding. Let's keep going. So make sure we understand and we are in agreement of what we are here to do. The goal of understanding, the goal of doing your science is not to have had a publication. It's not to have have published. The goal of going to the gym is not to have gone to the gym. The goal of going to the gym is to elicit a change, a response. So I push to you, the researcher, and say you are not done simply because you have achieved the milestone of being published in a journal or received permission to present at a conference or been given a spot in a poster presentation. And here is why. If we agree on science isn't finished until it's understood, here's the problem. As I see it, right now we face a distance of 17 years from publish to practice. That is a long time. That is most of a career for some people. 17 years. Well, where, why is the gap? People just don't have, they don't read anymore. They don't really care. I don't know. I'm going to push back and say some of it, we got to take some, we got to take some ownership. Some of it needs to be on us, the researcher, or another person on your team that you might not even know could be on your team. And that is a science communicator. So right now, this is what has been published. Someone gave me the citation. I'll share it. But right now there is a gap of 17 years from publish to practice. And here is an example of what that looks like. Now, imagine there was a big football game just a couple of weeks ago. Imagine there was another football game between these two teams, the Bunsen burners on one side, donned in their white scientific lab coats and their goggles. They are team pro science. They are made up of researchers and academics. They are here to find stuff out so we can improve our body of knowledge. And on the other side of the ball are the pseudoscience quacks. These are everybody we rage against on the internet. When they share stuff that is just clickbaity, it has no basis in science, but they say it. And their goal, well, just be nefarious. Their goal is to swindle people out of money and time and doing things that aren't rooted in science. I mean, you can rage against them as much as you want, but they are free to do whatever they want on the internet. Those are the rules of the field. Now imagine this. It's deep in the fourth quarter. And right now the Bunsen burners are down by six. A touchdown and an extra point, and they win the logic bowl. At stake, the attention of the public at large. So the stakes are high, and the Bunsen burners just received their kick. They've got to go 80 yards now to score, and the end zone is understanding. Remember that, not to have published, but to achieve understanding. So the Bunsen burners received the kick. They got grant funding. Okay, they've got the ball. They've got a chance. They've got some distance, but they have the ball. And they do some run plays, some science. They do some pass plays, some analysis. They mix back and forth. If scientists or academics or researchers were a football team like the Bunsen burners, moving the ball from the 20-yard line to the end zone of understanding, that is what you do. You do science. I'm minimizing it a little bit. But you understand because it's different for each of you, what you're studying and how you're studying it. But they're moving the ball. They're getting closer and closer. The stakes are high and the clock is running down. We're less than two minutes away from the end of the game. But the Bunsen burners are cruising closer and closer to the end zone when suddenly after a run play, 
They hit the 17 yard line. They're in the red zone. A quick strike pass to the end zone could put this game out of reach for the pseudoscience quacks. When out of nowhere, the quarterback of the Bunsen burners, for some reason, takes a knee. With five seconds left, an opportunity to strike to the end zone, the Bunsen burners quarterback takes a knee. You see, at the 17 yard line, the Bunsen burners reach the milestone that a lot of researchers reach, which is being published. And they thought that they were done there, so close to reaching that goal of understanding. And for some reason, they took a knee. Clock runs out, understanding is not achieved. And then who wins ultimately for at least another year till Logic Bowl number 52? It's the pseudoscience quacks. So I'm poking fun, but I want to make sure people understand you're very close when you're published. You're very close when you can give a, a presentation at a conference. You're very close when you're going to present with a, a poster. But my friends, you are not done. Tom Cruise is the most bankable artist, actor in Hollywood. But when he releases a movie, they run commercials. He does a press tour. There's a trailer. They share things in different bites. Say what you will about a movie trailer. I mean, they just give away all the good parts. But they give away enough to earn your attention, to make you want to go watch the movie. Why is your scientific research any different? I'm here to tell you that it's not. So to change a problem, first we have to understand how it is solved now. Now, unfortunately, the Bunsen burners were not able to pull out the win. There's no joy in Mudville. And the pseudoscience quacks, they win the Logic Bowl 51, but the Bunsen burners will be back next year. And between now and then, here is how science and knowledge translation and dissemination is solved right now. Posters and pa papers and presentations, oh my. Posters and papers and presentations, oh my. This is the way it is solved now, but here's the thing. It's not enough. This would be as if Tom Cruise just did the movie, shared it on one movie poster, did one interview and called it a day and then sat there waiting for the ticket sales to roll in. We would never assume that of a Tom Cruise blockbuster. Why do we assume that of our science? Because here's how I picture it right now. This is what I picture it looks like. This is the guy. I don't even know who this guy is. This is the guy who runs scientific journals, right? He's just collecting money on all the research, on the backs of all these researchers who need to be published to go through the peer review to make sure that what they are saying is valid. There's that process. I'm not saying skip that process. Keep that process. Don't change your research. Don't change publishing. But are there other things that you can and need to be doing outside of getting to publish? I think there's a disconnect. And the disconnect is the same as the logic bowl. Do not take a knee at the 17-yard line. You're so close to achieving understanding. Now, we're going to go through why that might not happen. And then ultimately, I'm not all doom and gloom. I'm going to show you how you can do this. I want, to I want you to leave with tactical examples of how to communicate your science. Before we do that, wrap your head around this. I like to simplify. Simple but not easy. I told you that would be a theme. Let's simplify right now. There's only two things that you can do with content. And I just want to make sure we're using the same terms. To me, content is any form of media. Words, videos, audio, images. That is content. All right? So now we have the same term. We're using the same terminology. There's only two things you can do with content. That's it. They're on the screen. You can educate someone or you can entertain them. That is it. I want to simplify this. Those are the only two things that you can do. <gasps> but wait, there's more. There's a magic third thing that you can do. What if you could educate someone while you're entertaining them? And it doesn't need to be all song and dance. It doesn't need to be stand-up comedy. But making it easy to consume, digestible, a little bit of sugar to make the medicine go down. You do great research. That, publish, uh, that publish, uh, publication in its form that's in a journal 
is not the only way that you can share that. So I'm here to tell you that science isn't finished until it's understood. Spreading your science is simple, but not easy. Now, the next image might trigger some of you. It is graphic. So if, if you're easily upset by images, avert your eyes. And here it is. Didn't think you'd be seeing roadkill in a presentation. Now, on the screen, you see, unfortunately, a, a dead raccoon. This raccoon was appears to have been run over by a car. And he's laying in the middle of the road. And that same day, someone got up and it was their job to drive down the road and paint two new fresh yellow lines that signal no passing. And that person did that job. They drove down the street and painted their yellow lines perfectly down the center of the street. Now, unfortunately, Rocky Raccoon right here met his demise the, uh, the night previous to this and was still laying in the middle of the road. And the person whose job it was to paint the lines, it's not their job to move the dead raccoon. See, they were, they were tasked with just drawing the lines, and they did that. That is the letter of the law for their job description. Paint yellow lines. Get in the truck in the morning, paint as many lines as you can, make them perfect, make them yellow. When he got to this part, though, he saw their dead raccoon. He decided my job is paint lines, not move dead raccoons. So he just kept going. And of course, we know the person probably should have figured out or called someone whose job it was to move the dead raccoon before they painted the lines over Rocky here. And I show you this story is in an extreme way that when we set out to do your research, I'm assuming your goal was to achieve understanding, not to just get published, not to just get to the 17-yard line and take a knee. This person's job was to do a good job. They didn't tell them, if you come across a dead raccoon, you need to move it because the lines, when we eventually do move the raccoon, there's going to be a space there. I want you to own this process, and here's why. No one is coming to communicate your science for you. They're not doing it. They won't do it because it's not their job. No one told them to. They're not incentivized to do it. And the other things, the other reasons are they, they won't do it as, as well as you. They won't do it with as much energy as you. They won't do it with as much insight into what you researched and what you learned. They just won't. So I'm telling you, this is a funny example. No raccoons were harmed in the presentation production. This is a silly example, a small example. I need you to own moving the dead raccoon because the goal is not to have published. The goal is to achieve understanding. I'm telling, I'm telling you this idea. I'm giving you this idea in multiple ways because we need to understand it for the rest to make sense. So I know you think you're just a researcher. You also need to be a communicator or hire someone who is. We'll get to that. So... Don't forget when you've published, don't forget you've got to move the dead raccoon if there's one in the way because your job is not just to paint lines no matter what's in the way. Your job is to try to achieve understanding. Now I'm going to come to your defense. Okay, it's not all doom and gloom. Jimmy's not here just telling you, hey, you guys don't do enough. You got to do more. I want to explain to you why it's so hard for you to achieve understanding. And I'm making a generalization, you as a researcher or an academic. Why is it so hard to achieve understanding? My first reason to come to your defense is I think you lack the three T's. We love throwing things in threes, right? I keep it simple, but not easy. Simple. Three T's. What are the three T's, Jimmy? Here's what they are. You lack the tools, you lack the training, and you lack the time. You lack the tools to communicate. Maybe you don't have access to software that will help you make a video. There's a bunch online. I can show you how to use it. Maybe you don't have a large Instagram account to share information once and thousands of people see it. We can build on that. So those are the tools, the things that allow you to communicate. And where you think you might not have them, they're on most uh, smartphones. But maybe you just don't know about them. Those are the tools. The training, well, once I tell you about the tools, I can give you a list that you can click and figure out how to use these tools or where they are. You have to know how to use them. 
simply having a hammer can be dangerous. I just bought a house last year. You can build a house. You can also do some damage with that hammer. So understanding how to properly use those tools is important. That's the second T. And the third is time. Maybe your job is to receive kicks and run running and pass plays, but communicating, it's not built into your time. So that might be something working against you. I'm telling you, you got to bake it into the cake though. Here's another story I'll tell you. I don't bake a whole lot. No, it's going to shock you. But if you bake a cake and you get to the last step where you're about to pull it out of the oven and throw the icing on top and you realize that you didn't put sugar in the mixture before you put it in the tin and put it in the oven, throwing 10 times as much sugar at the cake is not going to make that cake taste good. It's just not. So the parallel is if you don't plan on how you're going to communicate your science while you're doing it or before you're doing it, it will be 10 times harder and probably not as good if you do it afterwards. So baking this into the cake from the start will make things easier to achieve. So here's why a lot of times researchers don't achieve understanding. They lack the three T's, tools, training, and time. Keeping it consistent, simple but not easy. I think you also lack the three P's. And the three P's also make it hard to achieve understanding. Now, here's the three P's. The three P's are people, product, or process. Let's go through this. So researchers might have different people on their teams. Sometimes they are a team of one. Communicating this is effort. I have an entire college degree. I swear, it's hanging on the wall downstairs in communications. So to me, communicating is simple, but not easy. But if you don't have someone on a team who knows how to do it or likes doing it or has the time to do it, that is going to be a limitation. That's a barrier to you communicating your signs. So people is one of the three Ps. This is one of the reasons why it's so hard to score a touchdown if you're on team signs, team Bunsen burners. The second P is product or service. Now your product as your beginning is your movie or your research. Now being published is a great milestone. That is your product. I'm telling you, you need to create other products like the movie trailer, the press tour, getting Tom Cruise on the late night shows. Those things you might lack, you might lack. And then the process. Imagine you didn't bake in how you were going to communicate your science until after it was done. Again, that's like throwing 10 times as much sugar at the cake. It's still going to taste bad, but use 10 times as much. I'm telling you, if you bake it in from the beginning with a process, how to communicate becomes a lot easier. Otherwise, you're creating solutions every morning when you wake up. How are we going to communicate this today? And that's a lot of effort for a little bit of result. If you create a process, processes are scalable. So this is another reason. These three Ps. You might, you might lack people, the products to communicate, and the process in which to share that information. Okay, so those are the three Ps. Now, I want to give a parallel to the people who are in physical therapy. Here is what I see. You might remember this from PT school. This is the fit VP principle. This is how people gain strength. Fit VP, frequency, how often. Intense, how vigorous. Time, how long. The type, specifically the type. Volume, building over time. And progression, getting more difficult. These are exercise principles. I didn't make this up. This is the Academy of Sports Medicine. Fit VP. These are also communication principles. A lot of times I see researchers share research one time and expect people will then go to their publication or their presentation or their poster. We are big, dumb animals. If you have kids, you understand this. Adults aren't different. You don't, we don't get to act magnanimous. Adults are the same way. We are never... I shouldn't say never. Beware of people who say never and always. We often need to be told or reminded things more than once. Marketers will tell you there's a magic number seven. We need to see a message, hear a message, be exposed to a message about seven times before we ever think upon about acting on it. 
that last coat you bought, the vacation you took, likely it was not one message that caused you to take action. And remember, the goal is to achieve understanding for your research. To do that, we got to get them to read it, or at least some of it. So frequency is important. Screenshotting your abstract and sharing it once on Instagram, I got news for you. It's probably not going to make much of a splash, right? Intensity. How well are you communicating? How, how, how much sugar are you putting in this to make the medicine go down, right? We'll, we'll get into storytelling in just a minute. I'll give a quick example there. But intensity in exercise, how vigorous, right? There is intensity in communication. You can do that. And if you lack intensity, people will act accordingly and pay less attention or none at all. Time, what is the time frame? What is the type, the type of media? Is it sound, pictures, words, audio, volume? Are they hearing about it once frequent, frequency or are you building over time? Are you building an audience? And then progression, is it building towards something over time? How is it progressing? How is your communication? How are you messaging this? So here's also what you're up against. Looks like I'm sharing abstract art here on the screen. This part of the presentation, this slide, is to remind me, the presenter, to tell you about the signal versus noise ratio. Now remember, I'm recording this on February 22nd, 2024. And I looked at the front page of the internet and Googled it this morning. Today, February 22nd, as I record, is the busiest day in the history of the internet. The most things that are being posted and shared and retweeted, all those things. Today, today, what are the odds I'm giving a presentation about communication on the busiest day in the internet? What are the odds? Here's the thing. Tomorrow's going to be busier. It's only going to become a noisier and noisier world. When I was seven, there were like four TV stations and five or six radio stations and a couple of newspapers and oh, no internet. That was the noisiest it was when I was seven. But today, as we record, remember, it's noisy. And it's only going to get noisier. So what do we do? Give up? Don't do science anymore? Don't try to achieve understanding? No, of course not. The goal is to create a clear signal that can cut through the noise. Some people might say advertising doesn't work. They've got the objective data to say it does, right? You can use the same principles like the fit VP, fit VP principle to communicate your science, to communicate your message, to achieve understanding. I just want you to understand what you're up against. Simply telling someone you publish something is not enough. You fade into noise. It is simple though, but not necessarily easy. And I'll show you how. To create a to create signal amongst the noise. It happens. Other people do it. Why not you? I think you have to. Here's one of the ways. Here's one of the ways I think people in general fall short. Don't tell me about a story. I want you to tell me a story. That just sounds like Jimmy's just using double talk. What I mean by this is, don't tell me about a story. Yeah, a guy walked into a bar. It was crazy, man. Something happened. No. A man walks into a bar. He does this. And then this happens. There's a twist. You put depth into a story. And people are drawn in. And they remember the story and the punchline. Can you use the same principle? Don't tell me about a story. Tell me a story. And I'm, you have a chance at me remembering it. How does this relate to research? We're not talking about a man walks into a bar, but I think we are. I often see researchers start off a Twitter post about their research with a link to it. So that's a great chance. But they craft the post like this. We were recently published in this journal where we studied this about this. We is how they begin their message. As soon as you do that, you're telling me about a story. I need you to tell a story. What do I mean by that? Ask yourself, are you telling me something I don't know? Well, we were published. You didn't know that. Yeah, cool story, bro. Tell it again, as the kids would say. Is that helping me, educating me, or entertaining me? Is it making me become a smarter person? If you 
because you're giving me the message. We published this in this and we studied this and you want me to go somewhere else. Click the link to go there. I don't understand what I become when I go there. I don't understand why I'm going to pay attention and spend time on your science when I get there. I don't understand it. And you haven't explained it to me. You told me about a story. You did something and then something happened. Not intriguing. Not interesting. Therefore, I will not follow. I will continue on at what we call the speed of swipe. Don't tell me about a story. Tell me a story. Paint me a picture of what I will learn when I get there. Here is a paradigm that you can use. I tell people, don't pay attention to dollars. Pay attention to pesos. What does that mean? Peso is an acronym. It's a paradigm for communicating and messaging. And it, stand, it goes like this. Problem, agitation, solution, outcome. An example. Problem. A leaky pipe in your wall can cause thousands of dollars in water damage. That's a problem. Agitation. You might never know the pipe is leaking until it's already done irreparable damage. Agitation. Salt in the wound. Solution. Hire XYZ plumber, and we come and do an analysis of your entire plumbing system. Outcome. Sleep soundly at night knowing that there is no water damage happening in your house ever. We guarantee it. Problem, agitation, solution, outcome. It would be very different if XYZ Plumbing Company said, we are a plumbing company and we do plumbing analysis of your pipes and water damage is bad. That's them telling you about a story. In peso, problem, agitation, solution, outcome, they are telling you a story. Bonus points if you can tell me a story about me because now there's emotion tied to it. But Jimmy, I'm not selling plumbing analysis. I'm not selling these things. But if you did research that finds something that is applicable to people you want to reach and you put it through problem, agitation, solution, outcome, it intrigues them enough to take the next step, which is click and read. I sort of understand enough of what I'm going to get or become if I spend time reading your research and pay attention with your work. That post that changes from, yeah, I was, we, were, we were published in this about this. If you run that through PESO, problem, agitation, solution, outcome, Suddenly, the post isn't about you at all. It's not about the researcher or the research. It's about the reader. That's the person you're trying to get to understand. Shouldn't you design your communication for your audience and not you? So that is, if I were to have to sum one thing up in this whole presentation, if you were to understand, start with the end in mind, and the end is your audience. Your goal is to get them to pay attention and then spend time with your work. That is often the first disconnect. There are a lot of people who say, communications doesn't work. I tweeted that we had our, a paper published 50 times. Nothing. You took a step. But ask yourself, was that step effective? And if not, why wasn't it effective? Peso is just one way to communicate. Say it doesn't work. Watch your next infomercial somewhere. This is Peso. Over and over and over. And if it didn't work, they wouldn't have two hours on Sunday morning TV to sell you Flex Seal. It just, they just wouldn't. So it does work. At presentations, sometimes I'll just throw in a couple of onions into the audience. Why is the guy throwing, I don't understand this at all. He's out here throwing onions. Here's what I want you to understand with the onion. How do you peel an onion? Well, it's a couple ways, right? You just peel the onion, you start with the outside. What happens if you cut the onion? Oh, yeah, as soon as you cut the onion, tears. You try to skip a step. Because the right way to peel an onion is to start at the outside, find the seam, and then slowly peel the onion. Each layer will fall off, never cutting, never having to cry. Except what's in the middle of an onion? What's the purpose of peeling an onion? Is there a seed? Is there a pit? Is there something on the inside? No, it's 
it's onion all the way down. The purpose of peeling the onion is to peel the onion. The purpose of taking your research and breaking it down, peeling it open to communicate it is to make sure it's in smaller bites that people can see how they will become either educated or entertained if they spend time and pay attention with your research. So I like the onion analogy because the, the purpose of peeling the onion is the act of peeling the onion. That's it. That's the whole point. It's onion all the way down. That to me is the second most popular missed opportunity with communicating research is people like, I don't have time. Remember the three teeth. I don't have time. So I'm just going to cut to the chase and just give them the onion. So you cut the onion in half and you throw it on Instagram. You put it on Twitter. You share it on Facebook and people look at it and they're like, no, no, I reject this. But if you took the time to peel it and make sure they understood what they would become if they took time with your onion, you got a chance for them to pay attention and spend time. Here's the third most popular failure in communicating science, from my opinion. And it has to do with my Jeep and features versus benefits. So I got a red Jeep in my driveway. Love it. Always wanted a Jeep growing up. Now I have one. I'm an adult. Make adult decisions. I have a Jeep. Red four-wheel drive, Jeep Wrangler, hard top, but the hard top comes off. Those are all features of the Jeep. Those are all features of my Wrangler. But to be honest, I didn't buy the Wrangler for any of those features. Not one. I bought them for the benefits. Benefits of a Jeep. What are they? Well, I mentioned the features, right? Four-wheel drive, red. Uh, Four-door, hard top convertible. Those are the features. That's what we listed on the sticker. Features are facts. But we don't buy things on features. We think we do. I'll push back. I want to know if you agree or disagree in the comments. If you're still watching, if you're still paying attention. We don't buy things on features. Not until later. Not until a benefit has hooked us and we can picture something. Now, here are the benefits of my Jeep. Remember, four-wheel drive, four-door, red, hardtop convertible. Features, facts, tangible. We don't respond to those as well as we think we do. We respond to benefits. We don't have friends with features in college, do we? We have friends with benefits. I said it. Here are the benefits. Remember the features. Four-wheel drive, red, four-door, hardtop convertible. Now the benefits, why I actually bought this Jeep. Four-wheel drive. Do you think a little snow in upstate New York ever stops me from going where I want to go? Absolutely not. A story. You can picture that. It touches an emotion. That's a benefit, not a feature. It's red. Jimmy's not subtle. When I pull into a parking lot with my red fire engine red Jeep Wrangler, people pay attention. I don't want a subtle car. I want a car that stands out. That's a benefit to me. That's why I picked that red one and not a white one or a subtle one. That's a benefit. Red is the feature. Benefit is it stands out. Uh, Four door. You ever think I leave a friend behind? No. I fit the whole party in my Wrangler. We go wherever we want to go. That's a benefit not a feature. Features four doors. That's fact. What do I get out of it? That's the benefit. Hard top convertible. Well, you can touch the hard top. What's the benefit? Well, I'm covered until I want it, until I, I don't want to be. And then I go from covered to wind in my hair in 90 seconds or less. Most of the time, I see research communicated and it's a focus on features. I need you to explain the benefits at least until I get close enough to your work. I need you to leave with benefits. Help me understand what I will become after I consume your research. Paint me a picture. Don't tell me about a story. Tell me a story. What I will become, what I need to know if, if I watch the movie, if I go download and read the paper. Focus on benefits. I see many people focused on features. And I know it feels safe because features are facts and we're scientists and it's a world of facts. But humans are reading this and humans are big dumb animals, as my psychology friends say. We're big dumb animals and we react on emotion. I'm not telling you to make anything up. I had a question from the audience at CSM when I presented this. We have to invent benefits? No, 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 no. If there's no benefit to me reading your research, I probably shouldn't be spending time with it anyway. 
If you're telling me it has a benefit, I'm telling you to explain it to me simply. And if you don't, we move at the speed of swipe. You will continue and your work will continue to be ignored. I mentioned this phrase several times throughout this presentation. I use these phrases a lot, these, these two. Pay attention and spend time. Pay attention, spend time. You've yelled these to your kids. Pay attention. Spend some time on your homework. Pay attention. Spend some time mowing the lawn. Hey, pay attention. This is what you're trying to do, isn't it? You're trying to get people to pay attention to your work and spend time reading or consuming it. Except here's, I, here's how I look at these two phrases. They are transactional phrases. Pay and spend attention and time. You want their attention and time. Therefore, I push back at you and say, then you must pay and spend. And it doesn't have to be money. Not, not all transactions are monetary transactions. Reading your research, even if it's open access, still requires a cost. My most valuable asset, my attention, and my time. So remember, just read this. Why don't more people just read the research? How come 17 years from practice to uh, publish to practice? Why? It's free. I don't understand. We've never been more connected, remember? So many things are being shared every day. How come my stuff gets lost in the signal-to-noise ratio? Approach it as a transaction. Make sure I understand after I pay what I'm going to get. Make sure you lead with that benefit. And then you have a chance to get someone to pay attention and spend time. All right, so these, were, these are the big reasons why I see research not spreading or science not spreading. People not paying attention or spending time. And someone asked, this sounds like a lot. Is there anyone that can help? Yes, yes. Do you have to do this alone? No, I exist. Other people, many like me, exist. And you can do it one of three ways. You can communicate your science yourself. I bought a house two years ago. I learned what DIY means. It means an empty wallet. But you're going to do it yourself. You can do it your own way. You have an, you have an intimate knowledge with your research, but maybe you haven't communicated before. That's okay. There's a, a website I will throw out right now that can help you learn to communicate better. And it is G, write this down, O, O, G, L, E. It's Google. There is an answer to your problem on how to communicate science if you are willing to look for it. You can do it yourself. You can have someone do it with you. D, W, Y. If you work at a major institution like a university or a large organization, there are people, a lot of times, might be actually called marketers or communicators who can help with that and they can help you along the way. These are the people in your neighborhood. These people can help you. And there are also people who will do it for you, right? And that obviously requires a different kind of relationship. Maybe you hire an organization. I have been hired by organizations who have baked communication in from the start. And they have put me on their grant and said, part of the funding will go to communicating after the paper has been published. Because wasn't that the point? The person giving the grant is like, okay, so you're going to get published. If you can highlight to them, no, we're not stopping at the 17-yard line. We're punching this thing in the end zone. And you include a communicator on your team to achieve understanding. I would be, I would love to see an organization push back at that if they were giving out a grant and say, no, 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 we just, we're not part of that. Can't include that. We're, we don't want you to communicate. We want you to publish it and then just be done. I would love to be on that conversation. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I don't think it would. I've been a part of it. So that is, those are the situations. Great, Jimmy. Thanks for mapping that out for us. What do I do about this? How do we fix it? Here's a slide that comes up in my brain, in my sleep, whenever I am asked to communicate something and to help someone communicate something. Take a screenshot of this. This is what goes in my brain. Now, I learned communications and journalism from a Franciscan friar. I went to Catholic, uh, Catholic University. So they love to break things down. They sound so prophetic. And they broke everything down 
There are six questions that you can ask. That's it, said Brother Basil. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Just six questions. Now, there's an infinite variations of uh, infinite variation, amount of variation of those questions. But if you'll notice, and you're a quick counter, Jimmy's actually got seven questions on the screen. So let's go through this real quick. Does it matter who you're communicating to? That's the first question. Simon Sinek's uh, set, uh, book, Start With Why, and the subsequent TED Talk is the most viewed TED Talk in the world. Simon Sinek says you start with why. I disagree with Mr. Sinek in a good way. And I think he would agree with me. You don't really start with why, but you got to get to why. And the only way to get to why is by starting with who. I have a best friend and I have a gammy. And I speak about different things in different ways, depending on who I'm talking to. The who changes everything after that. Remember that. This paradigm, this walkthrough is for every single one of your audiences. Pay attention to that. It starts with who. Next up, you'll see the, the repetition of the question, what? That's how we go from six W's, six questions, to seven. On the left side of that Venn diagram, I have organizations or people list all the problems, the barriers that their who might have. On the flip side, I say list all the goals, the things they want to become, the things they can't get to because of the barriers. I call them bads and goods. Give me your bads and goods. I'm on the left side of that what? On the right side of that what, I say list all the advantages, the things that you know about, the things that your research can teach. Do that on the right side of the Venn diagram. Put them all down. And where you see the same word pop up on the left and the right, that gets listed in the center. And that is what's known as your shared why. Those are the reasons people should pay attention and spend time with your research or information or product or service. Focus on your shared why. Now, from here on out, I agree with Simon Sinek. Now, now the real work begins is now we have a shared why. It becomes very clear. It becomes simple, not easy to communicate after you understand your shared why. And from there, look at the steps. How, where, and when? How, where, and when will you communicate this? You know what you're communicating. We just solved that because we started with who. We asked what they wanted to become but couldn't because of their bads. We understood what value we bring, what areas we're experts on or our researcher experts on, where those two things cross are our why. You should only be communicating about those whys to that audience about that project. And it gets simple after that. How, where, when? How are you going to communicate it? Where are you going to communicate it? When are you going to communicate it? How do those steps look? That's where we dive in here. This is your content pyramid. So I start figuring out my messaging in the previous slide, this one. Once I understand a paper, an organization, an ad campaign's why, it becomes simple. I move on to this step. And it's in three steps. Love threes. Love threes. So here's your content pyramid. You start with pillar content. That's at the very top. It's a lot of effort to create pillar content, but everything else, it holds up everything else. That's why we call it pillar content. And that pillar content, remember we discussed what media or content was. It holds true. Look at that. Sound, words, video, live stream, meeting, in person or virtual. This is pillar content. Keep it simple. Remember, it's two cans and a string. This is words. This is audio, video, pictures. Keep it simple but it's pillar content. After pillar content, can we do anything with that? Well, of course. We create what's called micro content. You've seen this. You know what this is. You've seen this. A piece of pillar content might be a Yankee game. The broadcast of a Yankee game. That is pillar content. A lot of effort to get all those people together and film it, record it, play the game. Piece of micro content is a clip from the game or a photo from the game or a bit of audio recapping, a play-by-play -play of the game. Finally, what are you going to do with the pillar content, the micro content? You've got to distribute that content on TV, or on Twitter, or on Instagram, or on YouTube. And then finally, the researchers love this part. When you're done creating and distributing, you want to analyze. On which platform did I get the most engagement? Was it my message 
or the actual content that worked well or didn't? Could I improve how and where? This is where objective data comes in. I call it the audience engagement loop. Every month I take a look at everything I shared last month and I go, hey, what popped off, man? What was it? Let's see if we can figure out why. Let's take our best educated guess. Was it the content? Was it how I delivered it? Was it when? Was it luck? Let's figure that out. So I want you to pay attention to this. This is your, this is your content pyramid. At the top, though, if you're a researcher, you're like, I don't host a podcast. I don't write for a blog. I don't do videos. Well, those words are universal. Your paper is your pillar content. I'm telling you, simply taking a screenshot of the abstract and putting it on Instagram is not enough. You need a process. We discussed that in the three Ps to be able to mass produce clear and digestible pieces of content, pieces of micro content to get people to understand why they should pay attention and spend time with your research. If you do not do this, and it sounds hard, I'm telling you it's simple but not easy, you will continue to get the response of your research as a whole. Don't be upset with the results you don't get from the work that you are not doing. I am not telling you that it's all your fault. I'm just laying it out. These are the problems. This is how it is solved in other organizations, in other industries, and in other professions. Simple, but not easy. Now we start to get quick. I'm going to give you the strengths of each type of content. So audio. Audio can get really in-depth. Is this content the right content for your research or your product or your service? Audio, strength in conversations. It's mobile. You can listen to it. The audience can listen to it while they do other things. Interviews, narratives, roundtable discussions. That's how you might be able to use audio. How about writing? Write something on a website. Great for search engine optimization. That's fancy talk for if someone Googles something, Google might think you are the answer. You might pop up as the answer to their question. Gives you what appear with the appearance of what's called thought leadership. How can you execute on this? Articles, how-to guides, listicles. A listicle is seven ways to get the beach body. You can mock supermarket checkout magazines all you want, except they're still around. Now, their content might not be what you're interested in as a researcher, but how they communicate those things. People fall for them fall for them. They pay attention and spend time with them. Uh, video, the strength of video, engaging visuals and storytelling. You can do documentaries, tutorials, vlogs, live streams, real-time engagement. What I am doing right now, this is very meta. I am doing a live stream about teaching you about live streams. Behind the scenes, you could have conversations or give a presentation live. Uh, webinars or online meetings, real-time learning and interaction. That's like a closed door live stream, educational sessions, Q&A or demonstrations. Those are different, just a couple different types of media, pillar content, and the strengths and how you might be able to execute it. How about micro content? Quotes and graphics, use some poignant words, quick clips, a highlight of the Yankee game can get people to say, oh yeah, I guess I missed out on that. I should watch the next one. How about memes? I started this presentation off with the cat meme. Can I has your slides? People interact with familiar and funny. Remember, only two things you can do with content. Educate me and entertain me or both at the same time. How about infographics or data visualizations? Tell a complicated story simply with a picture. That was the first mass. Uh, sorry, not mass. The first communication form, right? Hieroglyphics, wall, paint on a, on a cave wall to signify something else. Our brain loves to compute that. Statistics, process flows, quick facts and an infographic. How about slides and Instagram carousel? It's the same as this presentation. Again, very meta, using slides to educate about slides. And then a Twitter thread, bite-sized learning in a bunch of micro blog posts on an app like Twitter. I'm not gonna call it X, I can't. It just, there's nothing in me that can help me call it X. And then where can you share these things? Listen, you understand the platforms. Where should you start? I tell people start where you're comfortable consuming information. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter are just a few. Your website, starting a podcast or a YouTube channel or a blog are other places as well. And then how do you do that? I've mentioned Peso before, but how can you actually do that? 
I did it, and I explain it with what's called the wheels of Psycom. Three different wheels. The what, how, and where. So watch this replay and just look. Hey, pick one thing from the what. One thing from your research. A personal story, methodology, a result, a headline from your paper. Everything in the what wheel is something tangible from your presentation. How about the how? Well, we just discussed different types of media, pictures, video, sounds, a webinar. And then where will you put it afterwards? Spin that wheel. There's lots of places. Now, here's the thing. If you spin all three of these wheels and it doesn't sound like it makes sense, don't create it. It has to make sense for the who to solve the what, to make sure we have a cohesive why, and make sure that media makes sense how, where, and when. So spin these wheels as often as you want to put together communication around your paper. And remember this, communicating. We're actually marketing your paper. I like the definition of marketing like this. Marketing is saying the same thing a thousand different ways. You tell your kids to clean their room. They heard that. That's one way. And then you might um, incentivize them. Clean your room, I'll give you five bucks. Mm, that's the same thing in a different way. Clean your room or I will take your entire allowance next week away from you. That is the same thing in a different way. So I am telling you, we are all big dumb animals that need to hear many things to make us act. These wheels, spin them. There are thousands of combinations of what, how, and where that you can use to communicate your science. I'm going to give you some specific ones. These are tactics. So this is actually called a Twitter poster with a nod to my friend Mike Morrison. Mike combined a poster presentation, which is static in nature, that you stand next to at a professional conference. And he said, what if I could make it move and explain more things with just one poster. So he turned a poster into a multi-slide GIF or GIF, a moving image that moves on its own. Mike gives away the formula for how to create a Twitter poster on his website with that link right there. You can get it if you download my slides from the beginning of the presentation. Another nod to Mike Morrison is what is known as the better poster design. You've all seen a professional poster that's designed poorly. We've all seen them. Maybe you don't know how to actually describe why it's or how it's designed so poorly, but we've seen it. It's a wall of text. Maybe it's just inundated with a bunch of graphs that you have to have a slide rule and spend 20 minutes trying to figure out how they make sense. Mike has a background in psychology and user experience and website design. He put those together and he said, this is a better poster design, which is why it's called the better poster design. If it looks like a billboard in the middle, that transmits one key piece of information, it's because it was designed as a billboard to transmit one key piece of information. He goes into detail in his YouTube video, which you can watch on YouTube if you type in Better Poster, that has garnered more than a million views. A million views for a 19-minute video about how and why you need to use a better poster design. Yes because his video is also a piece of science communication and it is done well. So I implore you to, to take a look at Mike's work and what other people have done with it to communicate their science and to communicate it well. Here's my last example, the one I will leave you with, the one that angered people at the conference that this poster was actually shared at. And here it is. Ed Hawkins drove people up the wall. This was his poster. Ed, where are your graphs? Where's all the words? Ed decided that the message that clearly communicated one thing, one thing well, was infinitely better than the poster that failed to communicate 15 things. So you walk away from this poster understanding that the average global temperature between 1850 and 2018 is increasing. But what if you wanted to go further? Okay, Ed, you have my attention. What am I going to do with it? Well, Ed was smart enough to know that the goal of the first date is to get the second date. 
The goal of the first date is not to get married. If you ask a girl to marry you after the first date, that's a bit much. The goal of the first date is to get the second date. Ed understood that. The first date was you walking by his poster and him earning your attention. And you understood something. But what if you wanted to know more? That's what Ed was banking on. That's why he included a QR code to go further. Because he understood that the message that clearly communicates one thing well is infinitely better than the message that fails to communicate two things. So to review, science communication is simple. It's just two cans and a string. It's very simple, but it's not easy. If you have questions about the presentation, drop a comment below and I will respond. My goal is that some of you will use the tactics I shared here to communicate your research. And that eventually, by the end of my career, that often cited statistic of 17 years from publish to practice is just a little bit lower. And the only way we get there is together. Thanks for watching.